I officially would like to welcome you to the CUSA Shop Talk with Family Search. And today, we are like fortunate to have Steve Waters with us. And Steve is a member of the North American Archives Relation Team for Family Search, primarily responsible for working with record custodians to help them preserve, protect, and provide access to historical genealogical significant documents. Steve is responsible for managing the work FamilySearch is doing in 20 United States. Now you'll notice we have another gentleman listed here, Manuel Sanfueza. Uh, he had a conflict this afternoon and we're hoping he may be able to join us later on, but if not, I'm going to just turn this over to Steve and let him take it from there. So whenever you're ready, Steve, just keep going. Thank you, thank you. So I should be able to start moving these slides, correct? Okay, there we go. Um, I think most of you, at least at some level, know who Family Search is, but we, we thought today that, um, well, we just, a month ago, just maybe as a little little trivia, we celebrated our 125th birthday. Uh, we've, we were founded in late November of 1894, so we just celebrated 125 years that we've been around. And I thought today it might help uh, if we start out with, because a lot of people ask, well, why do you do what you do? Have you been around so long? Why have you been doing this? And I thought uh, I would share something that very little, very few people know. We have a mission statement or what we call a pur purpose statement, and this is essentially it. Our purpose statement is that we create inspiring experiences that bring joy to all people as they discover, gather, and connect their family, past, present, and future. I think that's a mouthful, and we can maybe talk about that later in the question and answer period. But this is what drives our organization and has driven us for, for 125 years. And so then the question is, well, how do we go about accomplishing that mission? And uh, essentially, we're doing it through trying to offer to everyone who is interested free research and help tools. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, an overview of, of the magnitude of the work that we've done uh, in this year that just ended, 2019. So one of the ways that we go about accomplishing our mission is we're trying to provide searchable records for people. People can't have these enjoyable discovery experiences of their, about their family unless they can discover who their family are. And uh, I don't know who my great-great-great-grandfather was. He died way before I was born. And so the only evidence that testifies of him our records and other artifacts, uh, maybe a journal entry, an old picture, uh, a deed of a land that he owned, something like that. Those are the things that testify that he existed and helped me to learn about him and connect with him. And so Family Search, um, currently at the end of 2019, we have 6.3 billion total searchable records and on images online on our website that are completely freely accessible to anyone and everyone who wishes to go and have one of these discovery experiences. You can see some of the other numbers on there as well. I'm not going to read every every number on these uh, on these slides, but hopefully this will give you an idea of the magnitude of the work that we're involved in. Another way that we do that, not only are we helping people to search and find and discover their family uh, married uh, members and heritage, but we have an online family tree where people can enter those uh, those names into a tree and see how how uh, the family of man is all interconnected. Uh, we currently have one and a quarter billion names in the family tree that we have online. Uh, 47 million of those were brand new in 2019. Those are not names that we add to the tree. The patrons are doing this. They're building the tree from these discovery experiences that they have. And uh, you can see that we have almost 33 million people who have made contributions or added names to that tree. Uh, another way that we do that is now that you've gone and used records and found your family members and put them into a tree so we can see how they're interconnected and relate to each other, uh, you can add memories of various types to those names, stories, old photos, a journal entry, uh, a memory that you had. And in 2019, we had, um, we had eight, almost nine million new photos, stories, memories added to the people that are in the trees. Those were contributed, as you can see, by over a half a million people in 2019. Over a half a million people contributed at some level a story, a memory, a photo into the tree. 
Uh, another thing that we do is with all the work that's going on out there, people need help. And so we have a very elaborate help system last, and it's all volunteer run. And last year, uh, our volunteers in helping others to do this work logged 15.4 million free hours of service. Uh, 4.5, you'll see 4.56 on there. That's how many uh, hours were logged by the volunteers who are physically located in our 5,190 family history centers around the world. You also see on there that we had, uh, you want to talk about crowdsourcing, we had 318,000 people do free volunteer indexing of records last year. So um, the magnitude of this work is just incredible. Something that's fairly new for family search is discovery experiences, and we'll talk about this a little later, but one of the things that the family search did, and in fact, this is the 10th anniversary coming up here this year, is we started a, a conference that's annual in Salt Lake City. It's the end of February every year in Salt Lake City. We call it Roots Tech, and that name is derived from the word roots, which would, would insinuate genealogy or family history research and tech, which is technology. Uh, this work is becoming, as you can imagine, more technologically um, advanced and facilitated as time goes on with, with all of the, all of the internet and all the technological changes. And so 10 years ago, we thought we need to marry those two. You've got all these enthusiasts that, that like to learn about their family and do genealogy and there's all kinds of technological resources out there. How do we marry the two? And that was really the genesis of this conference. But you can see last year's conference was physically attended by about 25,000 people. And I believe there were representatives or people, attendees from every single state in the United States and many from other countries as well. Those who couldn't come physically, we had 81,000 people online that were at some level participating in and viewing this conference. So it was well over 100,000 people that it attended virtually or in person this conference. On our website in 2019, we had roughly 170 million hits or visits to our website. And uh, right now we currently have about 14 million registered users, people who have gone into FamilySearch and set up a free account that we know about that are using our website. So hopefully these numbers kind of give you an idea of the magnitude of what Family Search does and has done. And all of this, might I remind you, is all free of charge. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that free of charge as well. In the archival world, uh, we have several, we'll call them partners. We're certainly a COSA partner, but we partner with uh, these other groups as well. Even the more local uh, record custodians, your courthouses, churches, libraries, it could be museums, historical societies, genealogical societies, We've been partnering over the years with all of these groups. In addition to our efforts to digitize, preserve, and make historic records available online, we have also a book scanning operation some people don't know about. Uh, we have currently scanned almost, these would be authored books. So they're not uh, like a birth certificate or a deed or those types of records. They're actually books that have been authored by somebody that have some relevance to, to family history. And we've uh, photographed about half a million of those books. You see the list there of the various places we have uh, a book scanning installation. A lot of these are libraries, as you can tell, and the advantage of libraries is that they can share materials on an interlibrary loan basis. So if somebody has a book they want scanned and they're not at one of these locations, they can send the book to one of these locations, it can get digitized free of charge, and then it goes back to the original library. Um, we have, uh, this, this map gives you a little bit of an idea of where we have those centers currently. And as far as historical records go, we started photographing historical records in the US in 1938, so almost 82 years ago. And we were doing that through microfilming. About 20 years ago, we started weaning away from microfilm as microfilm became started becoming obsolete. But in the time that we microfilmed records, we amassed a collection of about two and a half million rolls of microfilm, which we have in, uh, in a vault in the side of a mountain here in Salt Lake. It's about 700 feet into a solid granite mountain. There's a vault where we've stored that film. Because of our 
concern for preservation, we have the last several years been converting that film to digital. About 90% of that film, or over 4 billion images, have been converted from microfilm to digital. When digital goes away, we'll be converting them to whatever the next technology is as part of our effort to make sure these records are preserved long term. And our indexing efforts, which as you saw earlier is volunteer based, are indexing about a million names every day. We, we tell people when they're looking on our website and can't find a particular family member or whatever it is they might be looking for, we tell them to come back again the next day because things are changing so fast. We're literally indexing a million names a day. We're putting up, um, we'll, we'll show this later as well, but we're putting up millions and millions of records uh, daily, weekly, monthly. And so things are changing so quickly. If you can't get what you need today, come back tomorrow. Uh, I put on there also the list of the types of records we typically are interested in. I didn't put date ranges on there. We're typically interested in the in the older, more historic records because we are trying to find uh, dead people, not children who were born yesterday. Uh, but that gives you an idea of the types of records that we typically would target. One of the other things that we've started doing that's new is that genealogists have, are historically thought of as elderly people, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old. And we're finding that the youth are, are, are getting more and more interested in genealogy, but they obviously look at it a little differently than, than older people do. And so we have an app gallery now that we've incorporated into our, in our website and our offering. These apps are not created by Family Search. There are developers out there that see how many people are interested in genealogy and the size of the potential market for their, for their product. And they're uh, creating these apps themselves, and then they're coming to us and say, would you expose them for us through your app gallery? Many of these apps are free. Some, the developers charging a nominal fee, $2, $5, something like that to use them. But there's a lot of games uh, that are being developed in the app gallery, and all as an effort to try and attract more youth uh, to, to family history research. We also have app gallery for those that are interested in doing stories and photos. We talked about memories earlier, and there's a whole bunch of different apps we offer, again, free and for a nominal fee that people can use that help, help them have uh, um, do various things when they're sharing photos and stories. Uh, we have app, apps that help with research. Maybe it's a way of uh, creating a fan chart instead of a family tree or different things that uh, to your liking to make the uh, family history research experience more enjoyable and easier to do. Uh, services that we offer to the archives are these. We do document digitization. I think we've worked with every state archive in the nation over the years at some level coming in and, and uh, digitizing or microfilming records. And those services are all free of charge. We come in and do those and give the, the record custodian a copy free of charge. Uh, we also can do something I think is a little bit unique. There's plenty of organizations out there that can convert microfilm to digital, but to my knowledge, we're one of the few that will come and do it on site. You don't have to send the film to us. If you have microfilm records that aren't our microfilm, something that you either microfilmed yourself or paid somebody to microfilm, uh, we literally have the ability to come in with high-end equipment and teams and uh, convert that microfilm or microfiche right there at your facility, again, along the lines of our interest in making sure that the records are preserved and do not become obsolete. We want to make sure they're migrated and, and uh, as technology changes. So we can come and do that. Uh, preservation, the records that we have photographed over the years, we still have. We're migrating them. We have them in multiple locations. Every year, I personally get at least one phone call, if not more, from a courthouse or somebody who's had a flood, a fire, or a hurricane, whatever, and they've had records that were destroyed or they've lost them for some reason. And knowing that we 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago photographed those records, I get a call or more than one call a year from somebody that says, do you happen to still have those records that you photographed 30, 40 years ago? Could I get a copy? We've lost ours. Ours were destroyed. And I get a great deal of satisfaction out of, out of sending them a copy of those records. Um, and we've done that free of charge as well. So we really are kind of a, 
an insurance policy and a, an extension of, of, of an archive zone preservation program. We've got your back in those cases. Uh, we talked about online indexing. That we've got uh, probably the biggest crowdsource that I am aware of that's out indexing records, hundreds of thousands of people indexing records so that these images that we're taking of records are searchable and they're easier to find. And that's, that's another service that we can offer um, with your records in the archives. And then online ex access, all of these records we're putting on our website. They're free for anybody to look at including the archives. We have several archives that instead of going through the IT effort of publishing or putting records online themselves, they're just using our services in their, in their reading rooms and things like that, or uh, their research assistants. It's much easier for them in some cases to go find them on our site than to go in the back and rummage through a box and look, them and try, look for them and try to make a photocopy. So these are the types of services that we, we feel like we offer uh, archives and they're all free. Um, in 2020, coming, this coming year, our plans are to try and up things a little bit. We were hoping in, in North America to do somewhere around, take pictures of somewhere around 35 million records in North America. We talked about book scanning and our, uh, our uh, digitization of records effort. We're kind of trying to merge those. So there'll be, there'll be different operations, but they'll be merged under one umbrella. That's something we're trying to do in 2020. Um, in 2019, we had about 50 full-time camera systems in North America taking pictures of records full-time, about 320 in the world, but about 50 or so in the U.S. We're wanting to up that to 70, so 20 additional cameras in the U.S. taking more pictures of records. Uh, we have seven microfilm scanners and fish scanners. We talked about that, those scanners can go from place to place and on-site convert microfilm and microfiche to digital. Uh, then you see some other numbers for flatbed scanners, form feed scanners, and planetary book scanners. Those are part of our book scanning operations. We can scan maps. You can see there is as thick as 42 inches wide. And then as far as how long they are, it's unlimited. I guess if you had a map that was 42 inches wide and 100 feet long, we could actually scan that. So what are some of the ways we think that we can help uh, you in the archival world? Uh, John, was, John is, is, is my colleague and, and he was supposed to do this presentation but got called away. So he put on there his contact information. We certainly welcome you to contact us for any reason with any ideas or things that you think we might be able to help each other with. But one of the ways, uh, the other ways we think we can work well together is, uh, is uh, you, We've got a lot of state archivists and archivists who've helped us. Uh, we can't go to every place in the world, but they've helped us in understanding what, what genealogically significant records are out there in your state, in your area, that you feel need preservation. Um, many of these record custodians cannot afford to do the actual preservation, but they've got the records. And so we think there's a great partnership when, when you're making us aware of these opportunities and we can deploy resources and help for free to get them preserved. Support, uh, many states have uh, digitization initiatives and projects that, that uh, maybe they're around a, a bicentennial or whatever the case may be. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to get involved and support those. Uh, maybe you've done work already on some records and there's some value add that we can do, create linkages to records on your website, uh, uh, that already exist. We're just trying to make records more available. So whether they're on our site or somewhere else, we're not too concerned. Any way we can help to get them more available. And so if you've got something um, on your end that we can link to or bring more attention to or more patrons to, we welcome that. Um, sharing indexes, uh, in some cases, putting the searchable index on our site so people can perform a search and then pointing directly to images you have on your site, that's another way that we could potentially work together. And there's probably others as well. But those are just a few, a few ideas we have of things that we might uh, be able to do with the record custodian world in 2020. Now we talked about Roots Tech a little bit, this event that's uh, it's 10 years in the making. Last year for the first time, we started trying to introduce archivists. Uh, we had a, I think there was a three or four hour portion of the conference last year where we invited people from the archival world to come in and instead of 
it being totally genealogically focused. It was it was more archivally focused as it pertains to the genealogy world. These genealogists and family history researchers are are largely your constituency, your patrons in that. And we thought, you know, for you to understand from a record standpoint what uh, these people want and need and uh, to kind of marry up that partnership, that that was a good thing. And it was actually fairly successful. So this year we've increased it uh, to where we have, we have, let's see, uh, we have an entire archive program this year. You can see Roots Tech will be in uh, Salt Lake February 26th through 29th, but we have an entire archival program and we are uh, welcoming and inviting anybody from the archival world that wants to come out to this conference to please attend. Uh, the, the people who register for and attend this conference uh, for us to re recoup some of our costs, we have a, a, a registration fee like you would for any conference you go to. And I believe for all four days, it's something in the ballpark of $169 or $189. We're waiving that charge completely uh, for any of our archival friends. So if you want to attend, you can contact John, me, or any of us, and we'll get you registered free of charge to come to this event. Um, here's just some of the highlights of what we're hoping to do in, in the event this year that would pertain to archives. And I guess rather than reading the list, I'll let you kind of read through it yourself, but there's some cool things. We've got some, some major breakthroughs technologically and in handwriting recognition, I think would be very interesting uh, to archivists. If you've got old records that are maybe harder to read and wondering how would we ever get these indexed, um, there's some cool things in technology um, that we've, we're getting close to offering that would make those records more usable. Um, the program on Wednesday, you see we've got some, uh, this is still being fleshed out, but as you see that we've got a few, few of the speakers you can see who are coming in and we'll be talking about access and preservation. There will be a VIP luncheon our, all of our archival, archival friends who come to the conference are considered VIPs, so we would welcome you to that luncheon. And you can hear from our CEO and from David Rencher, who some of you may know, been around a long time, and he's the director of our family history libraries, and he was our chief genealogical officer um, recently as well. Uh, there are some roundtable discussions. We've got uh, Dr. Eigner, he's, uh, he's from Austria, coming in, we'll be doing a round table around the time machine. Uh, I don't know if any of you know about that. You can see there's a link down at the bottom, but you can read more about the, what's going on in Europe with this concept of the time machine. He'll come in, he'll talk about that, and there'll be a round table discussion. Um, we've got another archivist from uh, North Rhine, Westphalia. I speak German fluently, so it's hard for me to read these things sometimes in English. It's Nordrhein Westfalen is, is the way it's said in German. But he's from that he's from that province in Germany, and he'll be here uh, with one of the round tables. Maybe some of you know Brewster Kale. He's with Internet Archives from the Bay Area in San Francisco area. He'll be running one of the round tables of the, with the topic of the Wayback Machine. And then we will have our own Ty Davies sharing with, with you the handwriting recognition uh, technology that I briefly touched on. We then have a series of roundtable, a second series of roundtable discussions that will be around more specifically how you work with family search and um, digitized records and how they help your patrons and our patrons and tips on how we create successful projects. Um, that's all Wednesday. Wednesday all day is kind of focused on archives. If you stay the other days, Thursday, Thursday through Sunday, we have other activities off-site, uh, visiting the Family History Library here. We have some discovery centers. You can go in and see what we've got going on there. Uh, we can get you one-on-one -on -one personal family history time experience so you can see what the researchers are doing by having that kind of an experience yourself. Um, and you see there are other things on there as well. Staying there at the Salt Palace, which is the venue for the event, we will have a VIP dinner that Thursday night. You all will be invited, as well as see our book scanning operation there. We have some DNA uh, presentations that you can see as well. And uh, here's a list of some of the topics or classes that might be of interest to you. I can get you more details on any of this. We just wanted to wet your appetite here 
because we'd really like to get as many archivists as possible to come out and, and join us for this event. If you are interested, please reach out to John. And there's his email. Um, mine is steve at familysearch.org. Very happy to, to sh talk to you as well if you want to reach out to me. And I think I went through the presentation maybe a little quicker than, than I expected, but that way I can save some time for some questions and answers at this point. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, guys. I lost my audio. Oh, okay. So it's back now. I, I My apologies. You know, technology, it's wonderful, but then when it goes wrong, you're like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. So, um, all right. Well, Steve, thank you so much for that informative presentation. Um, you know, I've got a couple of questions for you to start off. Um, and anyway, I let me start that and just remind everyone, if you've got some questions, now's a great time. Go ahead and type them into chat. And, we'll, and Steve will be happy to answer them. Um, how are you dealing with privacy issues and identity theft? Okay, well, a couple things, a couple thoughts come to mind. One is that the records that we're dealing with are primarily the older historic records. And so in most cases, it's not an issue. We're dealing with dead people. In every case, we're only dealing with records that are in the public domain by law. They're authorized for public access. So if we were dealing with records that are more modern, um, that potentially could have living data in them, we do a couple of things. Um, if permissible by law and there's no problem doing so, no sensitive information in, in them, we will publish them. If they have sensitive information, um, I know in some cases like a a death record, uh, the cause of death is considered sensitive, or uh, uh, maybe there's documents that have social security numbers in them. Uh, we will do one of two things. We either just won't publish those records at all, or we will redact that sensitive information. That redaction, the way we've been doing it in the past is we do it at the, we try to do it at the, at the site of digitization by just it, it's really not high tech it's just covering it up when we're taking the picture of the record but uh, rarely do we run into records where that's an issue again because they're older and they're dead people on that but if, if there are concerns or issues about that then we just flat out don't publish those records in most cases okay thanks um you know that brings up another question you kind of touched on that a little bit but why some records are visible and others are not so even though records are, in, we're only dealing with records in the public domain, every record that we photograph and publish, we do it with permission of the record custodian. Uh, any of you that we've worked with, you know that we come in and we have you sign a permission agreement authorizing us to publish these records. We don't come in heavy handed and say, hey, they're public, give them to us, we're going to put them on our website. We want to make sure that it's, that it's something that you agree to and you're comfortable with. Well, part of that permission process, in, in many cases, we've had record custodians that, that want to put some kind of a, a limitation or restriction on our publication for, for whatever reason. So um, maybe they're making revenue off of them. And, and so having them completely free, they're, they're afraid would, would hurt their revenues. So they may say something along the lines of family search, go ahead and come in and photograph these and publish them but only publish them to certain groups, like only, only show them to your family history centers and not everybody else because we want to preserve some group that, that has to come to us and see those images. So the short answer to the question is it, we would open them up to everybody if we could, and if we're limiting the access, it's typically been imposed on us by the record custodian or it's something they've requested us to do. Thanks, that, that, that's a good point. Um, you know. I, looking on the FamilySearch site, um, you have to log in. 
Why is that a requirement? You know, and that wasn't a requirement until about a year ago. And uh, I think there's a few reasons for that. One is part of those permissions that I mentioned to you earlier. We've had uh, numerous record custodians that say, yes, you can show my records on your website, but we'd like the users to be registered. Uh, we, want, we want to know who's looking at them. Um, I think that was part of the paranoia of, of identity theft and that, and they thought if anybody in the world could come to our site and see these records, uh, somebody with nefarious um, intentions could come and look at them. And you know, our pushback was, well, they're public records. They can go get them anywhere. We're, we're not going to show them to nefarious people. But the comfort level of, well, if, if everybody has to come and register on your site, then we at least have some idea of who's looking at them and people with bad intentions are going to be less likely to register on your site. And so we implemented this registration process. It's completely free. There's, I know some people think if they sign up for it, that 30 days from now we're going to call them and say your free period ended, now you have to pay, and it's not true. It's free forever. It's just a way of us kind of keeping track of uh, who's using our site. It's good for us. It's a way we can monitor some of those numbers I shared with you earlier. Um, and it's, uh, it's given some of the record custodians a little more peace of mind that we have a little bit of a handle on who's coming and looking at these records. So that's it. No tricks about it. Okay. Well, a follow-up to that. Um, is that something that, you know, you guys are able to extract some data from, from the login process. Is that something you can share with, say, your partner? So let's say I'm in New Mexico and uh, we've done records with you, and we're just kind of curious how many people from New Mexico are logging into FamilySearch. Is that something you would be able to share with us? I, I don't know if we can do that. I've had some, I've got some archivists out there that would like to have data quarterly from me. I don't want to create busy work for myself, so I'm almost reluctant sure. to say this, but I do I do have a few record custodians out there that I won't name that have asked me, Steve, on a quarterly basis, could you send me a report of the usage of our records? I've had that where they want to see all of the different collections in their state that are on our website, how many okay. and so forth they're getting, because I guess they go back to their Secretary of State or whoever their governing body is, and they say, look, you know, we don't have as many people coming in brick and mortar to our facility, but because we've partnered with Family Search, look, we've got 1.7 million people last year used our records through the through okay. the website there. So, so we've provided that kind of detail, but it doesn't say how many of those people are from that state. It just okay. says how many people are utilizing the records from that state. So I, I'd have to check and get back to you on that, see if I could do it at the level that you're talking about. Okay, but even just having people, um, repositories, archives, being able to say, this is how many people have come to us electronically for these records. Um, well, a few people that are is doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a few archives doing that. I'm, like I say, I'm reluctant to say that because I don't want to get sure. 100 more people call me and say, hey, I'm going to be getting the report business really quick. But, but it's not too difficult for us to do that if it's helpful to you to do that. Okay, great, thanks. Well, I've got one more question, and hopefully everybody, if anybody's got some questions, sounds a great time to type them in. But I've got one more here. Um, all right, you've mentioned everything is free. And, you know, who's, pay, who's paying for this, and, and will, it, will it stay free? So you saw in my slides the amount of free labor that does this work. Yes. If you remember the slide, 15.4 million free hours in 2019. So I don't know if those people were paid 10 bucks an hour even. That's $150 million of free labor that we got through our volunteers. And uh, the portions of the work that we pay for, that money comes through gifts and donations. You, many of you know that the Family Search is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the members of the, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, we, we live the law of the tithe that, that perhaps you read about in, in the Bible and other places. And so many of the members of this church uh, are tithed and, and give 10% of their, their income uh, back to the church to further whatever good work is required. Um, that equates to a lot of money. And then there are philanthropists who come and donate millions. The money comes from lots of different sources, but there are 
I don't I couldn't put a I couldn't put a number on it, but it's millions and millions and millions of dollars that is gifted through tithes, donations, philanthropy to this work. Um, and so the paid portion of this work is, is financed through those gifts and donations, and the unpaid portion is financed through uh, the gifts of people's time and volunteer efforts. And it, but it equates to tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, this work is not small, as you can see. It's incredibly expensive, and it is nothing short, of, in my mind, of a miracle that we have so many people willing to donate their money and their time to this work. That just tells you how valuable and important it is to, to them. So rather than be long-winded, that's essentially how it's paid for. And so uh, and okay. we don't see that changing. Uh, we have no intention whatsoever of ever of ever making this a for, for a fee service to the archivist okay. or to the patron. Well, Steve, we appreciate sharing all of your information and uh, answering these questions for us. Um, I don't see any other questions or comments at this point. So, um, Steve, thank you again for being our presenter today and for sharing more about what Family Search is doing. Um, for our attendees online, just to remind you, we've got more great webinars. We're just starting our new 2020 member webinar series, and so here's a look at the the first four months, what's got coming, and so I hope you, uh, if you haven't signed up, you know, if you want to be really efficient, just go in and sign up for all of them at the same time. You know, go in and just register for all of them. That way you won't have to remember each month, oh yeah, I've got to I'm sign up for that. Our SERI, our uh, State uh, Electronic Records Initiative, also has some great uh, webinars coming up, so we hope you'll take advantage of those as well. And then, of course, we'll have some future soft talks. We've got one with Ancestry coming in March or April, so watch our website for details on that. And as always, we want you to stay connected, and there's lots of ways you can do that with COSA through our websites, our resource centers, Twitter, Face page, and YouTube. So we hope you'll all do that. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Steve for his time today in sharing the activities that Family Search is doing. And if you do need more information, of course, you can contact uh, John or Steve directly at Family Search. Um, and I do would like to ask everyone to do take a few minutes and answer our webinar evaluation questions. It really does help us as we plan for future webinars. And we thank you for joining us today. We hope you found it informative. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Steve, thank you very much. Everyone, thank, thank you, you and having a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.